So as a biologist, I'm not too used to these crowded rooms and also not that there's a bouncer actually sending people in another room. So <laughs> thanks for that. Um, so basically um, how I want to start is that the uh, recent pandemic has really shown us that viruses can be a real uh, piece of work. And um, so viruses, they infect humans, they also infect animals, but bacteria, they have their own nemesis. So there's also uh, phages. Um, basically, those are viruses that infect bacteria. And they have taken on this fight uh, 3 billion years ago and uh, came up with a defense mechanism. And this defense mechanism is better known as CRISPR-Cas. So CRISPR-Cas consists of this protein, Cas9, which you can see here, and then the guide RNA, which you can see in, in yellow. And uh, the beauty of the system is really that you can uh, program it. So it is able to search for DNA, bind to it, and then precisely cut the DNA. And this has been really a breakthrough in life sciences and in, in, in medicine. And this has then also been recognized with a very fast Nobel Prize to Jennifer Doughton and Emmanuel Charpentier just eight years after the discovery. And as you might know in biology and chemistry, it usually takes like kind of half a lifetime. So uh, for as, to, of, as of today, we kind of see these um, first generation CRISPR tools just as a scissor that basically cuts the DNA in a very precise manner. But then the problem is really that uh, usually very uh, small changes in a genome, so single nucleotide mutations, uh, are frequently sufficient to really mess up the entire gene and then give rise to disease. And these diseases can be very severe, as uh, some of the examples you can see listed here. And it's um, assumed that roughly 6% of the human population actually is uh, suffering in, in, uh, in, in some term of a rare disease and of any kind. And this may sound like a small number, but 6% uh, of the population has really like 500 million people suffering from rare diseases. And to solve this problem, scientists have really worked on um, improving the CRISPR tools and then came up with these molecular pencils. So these um, new tools then are really able to very precisely swap out nucleotides on a genome level. And the first, uh, basically, original CRISPR-Cas tool is very efficient, but it has its troubles to really uh, fix very small changes in the DNA. And that's why we have, I'm sorry, we have this, um, what we call base editors, which are really pencils. And those basically built up on the principle of the first CRISPR tool, but they are, have attached an enzyme that is then able to convert specific bases. And base editors can convert A to G mutations, and C to T mutations. They also face their own challenges. So if there's um, more A or C letters in the code in close proximity to the target, then they may also be changed. So here is like a very brief simulation how a base editor actually works in action. So the protein uh, uses the guide RNA to search the 3 billion bases of the genome and then really very precisely locks onto this sequence. Uh, engages with the enzyme attached and then converts the uh, malicious base back to, into the healthy state. So the question is then really how do, you, how do we design the guide RNA correctly? So if we assume that this is our genome here and there's a mutation and we try to fix this, then we can just put the guide RNA on top of that, right? Or might the design be better here or maybe on the other side of the strand? So this is kind of a problem, and um, each mutation that we want to target really gives rise to many possible CRISPR designs. And how we approach this is really in a high throughput manner. So um, what you can see here is our design of where we couple the guide RNA and the DNA target on one molecule. And how this works is that the red part basically gives rise to the guide RNA, and then this guide RNA can then travel it's a bit fast. Uh, then travels to the blue part here and then engages with the CRISPR protein and does the editing there. And this then enables us to test thousands of, of designs in parallel. And here's the entire workflow. So basically we come up with this library where we really encode 10,000 of different uh, guide RNA and target pairs. And then we integrate this stably into uh, living cells. 
And from there, we then use our um, base editor or CRISPR tool in general, uh, get it into these cells, and then let the editing happen. And after the editing has occurred, we then uh, are able to use high throughput sequencing to then really determine the changes um, that occurred after editing. And we then really look into what, um, how, do, how do these changes look like, which uh, nucleotides have been swapped, etc. And this then gives rise to large data sets, which is, of course, uh, as you know here, um, the perfect starting point for machine learning. And as I'm a biologist, and Nicola will touch on this point on a similar note later, I'll not go into detail here, but what I really want to emphasize is that we have now a tool that empowers us to predict the guide RNA designs before performing the experiment. And this then really is very useful because we can then choose what hits we want to validate and this then accelerates our research in the lab a lot, and it also saves a lot of resources that we, we don't want to waste on reagents that for guide RNAs to test that we don't want to need. Um, yeah, if this sparked your interest, this has been published, um, and if you uh, feel free to check out the publication. And um, together with Amina, we were actually working on a story on a quite similar load using the older sister of the CRISPR protein, so stay tuned what comes next. And uh, with this, I want to give the stage to Nicola. Thank you, Kim. So Kim showed you basically a very fascinating tool base editing before. Now, this was known as kind of a second generation uh, CRISPR editing, but there was also a third generation um, that came up in 2019. Uh, we call it prime editing. And if you imagine Cos9 nucleases as scissors and base editing as pencils, then prime editing is like a, a word processor. So you can not only replace certain parts of the genome, but also insert or even delete um, your desired edit. How, does it, how is it different from the other tools? So you see here at the top that primating makes use of a reverse transcriptase domain. And this domain is able to copy information from RNA into DNA. And this helps us because we can actually include the edit that we want to make into our guide RNA here shown in blue. When we look a bit closer, uh, we see that this guide RNA is now longer than for the base editing and Cos9 nuclease because it also includes this upper part here um, with this extension with this so-called PBS and RTT. Uh, PBS stands for primer binding sequence and RTT for reverse transcriptase template. And there are variable dis different design options and this reverse transcriptase can actually convert then or basically copy the information here into DNA. Long story short, after this happens, DNA repairs from the cells comes in, and if everything goes well, you end up with your edit DNA. However, the efficiency of the edit is very variable depending on all of these designs that we see here, which makes it a perfect case for um, further diving into the, um, the determinants and which uh, parts make it more or less efficient. So we made use of a similar concept that Kim showed you before for base editing, but this time with uh, the primating and the primating guide RNA. And this allowed us then to gather a data set of, in this case, 90, more than 92,000 different PEG RNA designs. And together, um, in the end, we get this amplicon sequencing and we get an efficiency score for each of these designs, which serves as a perfect kind of data set then to use for machine learning. So to kind of convert this um, data set into something that the model then can, can read, we look at each design as follows. So we have an original sequence here at the top and also the positions for each um, position in these sequences. We have the mutated sequence, which means what, what you actually want to change. In this case, we show you a G to a T mutation. And then we also have some more information because the model needs to know 
um, where in the sequence are these different parts of this guide RNA that I showed you before. So the, for example, the spacer here at the beginning, and then this PBS and all this information together we can then feed in to our model. Uh, basically first uh, we use the information from the original sequence, um, we embed it and we use a bidirectional recurrent neural network and the attention layer on top. Uh, similar, we do it for the mutated sequence and we all add also part of more general uh, features such as um, minimum free energy which, which is how the guide RNA folds together and with all this information we are able to kind of show or represent our data set well in a in a model and perform actual predictions. When we then compare this uh, model um, to, with other baseline models, we saw that this outcompeted these other models, for example, the tree-based models here, and especially also the linear regression-based. And we achieved the correlation from the prediction to the to the measurement of Spearman 0.85, which is for our case quite quite a good start because it helps you to really um, lower the, the amount of guides you have to test for your desired edit. Uh, this model is called PREDICT for Prime Editing Guide RNA Prediction. And we also want to make it um, accessible for researchers, especially many biologists are not that familiar, let's say, with uh, working with code and models. So you can actually go to the website called PREDICT IT and you can uh, input the change that you want to make and then the model in the background gives you all the different guide RNAs that you could use and how efficient they are um, in comparison to each other. So this work was published early last year in Nature Biotechnology and we had an update in autumn on BioArchive and in this update we also include some information about chromatin which I won't talk much today, but basically we also saw that it not only matters what sequence you want to edit, but it also matters where in the genome it is. So basically how um, the, your target is wrapped around proteins and histones in your cell uh, nucleus. So this is, um, you can look it up here and we hope to publish this as well soon. With this, uh, I already come to the summary. Um, so I would say gene editing is a, is a promising strategy for both fundamental research and also the treatment of genetic diseases. The design of uh, CRISPR-Cas experiments can be accelerated with the prediction models that we showed you today, um, especially facilitated by these high throughput methods um, we employ in our lab. And finally, the kind of CRISPR-Cas field is developing very quickly. Um, that also requires us to continuously update these models and basically every few years there will be a new model so I don't think we will run out of work here. Um, and with this I come to the end and thank you for your attention and we are happy to take any questions. We have time for one question. If you. Uh, if nobody has questions, I have one because we were working together. I know that you cannot replicate like precisely your experiment, right? Every time when you replicate, you have a correlation 0 0.9, but you never get exact same results. So what do you expect? For example, machine learning models, we only reach also 0 0.8. So in which level of precision do you think is possible so that eventually it will be applied and also how ML models can actually improve because your data is already very noisy. Yeah. Um, I would say you, uh, with the, we can do it different experiments, so they, they will correlate um, with each other with a certain level, and then we take the average, and I think the, the machine learning model can come close to this average, but as you see, if you then, in the end, do your um, experiment with one replicate, you, you cannot kind of surpass this um, this variability because we have this noise inherently in our um, data set already. Um, I th would say for our case, we don't aim to 0 0.99 in the end um, because we can already exclude a lot of um, bad guide RNAs and this already helps the field a lot. Um, but maybe this uh, will also change the future and we can get more and more accurate. But 0 0.99 is a, is a, will probably never 
is there a bar that eventually that they allow you to apply in the clinics? Like you have to reach this precision or not? So I think in the clinics, you in the end still have to try it out whether it works or not. So uh, I think we are still a, a step away from just predicting and um, putting into the patient. Okay, thank you.